Every time there is a new motherboard release, there is a new comparison. And today is the Ultimate X470 motherboard showdown with three different boards here on the line. We've got here the Crosshair 7 from Asus. We've also got the Gaming 7 Wi-Fi from Aorus. And then on the left, we've got the Tai Chi Ultimate from ASRock. All three of these boards, I'm gonna say straight away, they're all really solid. Of course, they all come in at a premium price. We'll talk about the prices related to the features a little bit later, but today we're gonna to go through all the things like auto overclocking, VRM temperatures, M.2 shields, NIC speeds, USB 3 speeds, and even the audio and the crosstalk, and also the noise related to that. So let's find out which motherboard is the best for you. Welcome back to Tech City. And first up, we have the Crosshair 7. And this has a 10 plus two phase power design, IR3555, 60 amp power stages on the MOSFETs. Also, they have micro alloy 60 amp chokes. Asus claims these do better than other chokes. Of course, it's not that important when it comes to air and water overclocking, but for the capacitors, they're using 10K NicheCon capacitors. Then we move over to the Gigabyte Aorus. That's using, again, a 10 plus two phase power design. However, in the middle of the phases, they've put the two SOC phases because they believe that separates the heat on the VRM with the four phases at the top and then the two phases being in the middle and the six phases down the bottom being directed to the CPU. They're also using 40 amp IR3553 power stages for the MOSFETs, 60 amp chokes, and then 10K Nichicon capacitors. Moving over to the ASRock, this is a 16 phase power design, 12 plus four. We've got four phases, which essentially are doubled. Then we've got 12 phases using Textrous Instruments, Nexfets, MOSFETs. These are rated at 40 amps each, chokes are 60 amps, and they've got 12K Nichicon capacitors. So ASRock are implementing in on paper what seems to be the most solid VRM. However, in practice, when we look at what a 4.2 gigahertz overclock does on water, we can see that that's using up 100 amps. These boards are rated for like 400 amps plus. So you can see just how much overkill all three of these motherboards have on the VRM design. They all have eight plus four pin power connectors. However, you really only need to use eight pin on your standard water and air overclocks. Even a four pin might just do you fine. Though speaking of auto overclocking, a big question that gets asked here a lot on the channel when it comes to selecting a motherboard. If you buy one of these motherboards, is it going to be able to do a better auto OC than the others? Well, the Crosshair has an auto four gigahertz overclock. And after I tried this, I realized that the 2700X actually on its XFR uh, technology boosted higher than this thing did out of the box. So on water, if I've got a H110 for instance, it was going over four gigahertz anyway. So if you are into auto overclocking, all three of these boards will score relatively the same because the auto overclocking on the 2700X is actually quite good this time around. And that's got to do with AMD programming the CPUs relative to the motherboards themselves. And of course, how cool your CPU runs. Now you can have the best VRM in the world. If the cooling design for that VRM isn't any good, then you could see overheating in the real world, especially in a stuffy case with no airflow. But I was happy to report that all three of these designs we're doing a phenomenal job of staying pretty cool. On a 4.2 gigahertz overclock, the max I saw on all three boards was under 70 degrees. I think the Zeus edged out with one degree better than the other two solutions. So they're all coming relatively close, but I will give props to Gigabyte and their fin design on the heatsink. I really saw a difference with the uh, thermo cam. You can see that the heat was dispersed really well across this VRM heatsink design. So if it's one thing, the old school fin design is definitely worthy of coming back on the motherboard VRM. I love it when companies say, hey, even though this may be not looking as good aesthetically, it's gonna do a better job in functionality. And that's exactly what this heatsink here from Gigabyte is doing. Uh, even though it doesn't really make a difference in the real world, you could probably run all these VRMs without a heatsink at all at 4.2 gigahertz but it's still one of those things that's just attention to detail. Though these motherboards being as expensive as they are, one must wonder about audio. And if you've got a good pair of headphones, what can you expect out of all three of these motherboards? Moving on to crosstalk, it's important because we're gonna isolate these two motherboards here, the Crosshair 7 and also the ASRock Tai Chi Ultimate. They had really good crosstalk, however, that was below a volume level of 91. As Soon as you up the volume over 91, it introduces some slight leakage into the right channels. I don't know exactly why this is happening, I just know it's happening. So for the best listening experience, 
you'll want to leave your volume under 90 on these two motherboards. The Gigabyte one in the middle, this is an interesting kettle of fish as well because when we had the audio plugged in the rear output, I couldn't get anything out of it. It was a little bit buggy. So I had to depend on the front audio output on this motherboard. However, there was really low crosstalk going down levels of near minus 90 dB. Same for these other two solutions here. Uh, one thing to note with the Gigabyte, the volume level was a little bit lackluster. Uh, even with the headphone amp level three, I was sort of a little bit not used to this because I know in the past Gigabyte have implemented some really heavy headphone amps on their motherboards and that has really given a lot extra volume level. This time around the volume level is a little bit lower. Uh, as opposed to the other two boards, of course, all three of them are scoring really well on the frequency response curves. I was just shocked. Again, as I said in the Tai Chi Ultimate review, if you wanna check that out independently, I'll put the link up here. The frequency response curves is the best I've ever seen. It's like onboard audio just keeps getting better. All three of these boards had such a tight range. I think it was like minus two decibels below 10 hertz. After 10 hertz, there was no drop off at all. So if you love sub bass, you're gonna get a really good experience, depending on your headphones, of course, with all three of these motherboards. So what about the mic inputs? Well, the ASUS and also the ASRock, I believe they're using noise suppression all the way up to 30 dB plus 100 volume. There was no noise coming in. The Gigabyte had the option to switch noise suppression on and off. When we switched it off, the sweet spot was 50 volume plus 20 dB. This is a level I recommend using if you want your voice to sound natural, especially if you have a decent microphone. If you've got a real tinny microphone and you just wanna play games, then maybe just turn noise suppression on, smash the volume up, and then everyone can hear you easily. So now we're gonna go through the BIOS feature set and also other features on the motherboard. This might take a little while because all three of these motherboards are feature packed. First off, we're gonna look at the M.2 slots. NVMe M.2 X4 Gen 3. The ASUS board has two of these on board. So yes, you can do RAID 0 NVMe across Gen 3 if you wish to. This is going directly to the CPU itself rather than going via the Gen 2 chipset. This is important if you want to get the maximum speeds possible and you want RAID 0 across a scratch drive, for example, if you're editing videos. Absolutely phenomenal speeds. The other two boards, they have only Gen 2 on one of the slots and Gen 3 on another. And the Gigabyte makes a big statement of saying it's rateable, but there's, I don't really see a point in, especially doing a RAID 0, for example, maybe doing a RAID 1 is okay, but doing a RAID 0 uh, with a Gen 2 slot is really just gonna halve your speeds, especially if you've got like a Samsung Evo, for example, that can go up to around three gigabytes per second transfers. So the ASRock is similar as well. It's got a Gen 2 slot, and you've got a Gen 3 slot. So ASUS are definitely leading the charge in this one because you can select the speeds to take it down to Gen 2 if you wish to on the NVMe device. So it's great to see that ASUS are innovating here, uh, but this time around, Gigabyte also have two heat shields on their NVMe drives. I think that's what I'd like to see ASUS do since they do have the two Gen 3 options, uh, but all three of these devices have the heat shields that actually work. When I tested the temperatures, there was a significant drop when we were using the heat shields both on the thermo imaging camera and also in the thermo sensor on the actual software itself. So we saw drops indicative of that of 20 degrees plus across all three devices. They do spread the heat quite well. Uh, again, you only get one heat sink with the ASUS model and the ASRock model, but you do get two heat sinks with the Gigabyte model, which is props to them, especially in the case of ASUS because they've got two Gen 3 slots. I'd like to see two heat sinks on the ASUS model in particular. So now if you weren't sick of this X470 comparison already, then you may be getting sick of it right now because we're gonna talk about all the little gritties on these boards in particular. And first of all, the fan headers. You get eight fan headers on both the ASUS and the Gigabyte models. Uh, the ASRock only has five fan headers that are PWM controlled. So I would like to see them, especially on their flagship board, add more fan headers. As I know a lot of people nowadays are building computers with literally like six plus fans and they're all RGB. So it is good to see that control on the motherboard itself. You don't have to go through any controllers. So if it's one thing to critique about the ASRock board, I would like to see a few more. You do get power and reset buttons on all three of these models. The Gigabyte for some reason has decided to go with that power button on the actual IO shield itself on the rear. Interesting move. Uh, personally, I like to see it on the motherboard because it's more of a test bed feature. I mean, if you've got this installed in a build, you're gonna have that power button installed to the motherboard anyway. Though what we're seeing on the rear of the board here is IO shields that are already attached, pre-attached 
to the Zeus Crosshair and also the Gaming 7. The ASRock doesn't have this feature. I personally do really like it. I think it's a very cool addition, especially to a flagship board. Uh, so I would like to see ASRock add this on. In terms of rear input and output, they all come in pretty similar. The ASRock Taichi does get separated from the other two, which have 10 USB slots on the back, also a Type-C, and also their dual band wireless, uh, 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz across all three models. Now the antennas are quite uh, different. The ASUS and the Gigabyte model have their stand-up detachable uh, antennas. The ASRock includes the two uh, antennas that just directly attached to the slots themselves. All three boards have clear CMOS on the back and the Tai Chi Ultimate has a 10 gigabit solution NIC installed. Uh, now, if you do go with the normal Tai Chi, you will get two extra USB slots. Uh, so the one thing that is limiting the Tai Chi Ultimate as it only has seven standard USB slots on the back and of course that type C as opposed to the other models which have 10. Also testing out USB 3 speeds across all three devices was absolutely fine and testing out the one gigabit per second NIC speeds were great and the 10 gigabit NIC speed from ASRock was absolutely fine too. So they're all delivering consistent performance across the board, whether it be the VRM, the audio, or the functionality of the board itself. They're moving deeper into the BIOS, which is an important thing if you are into overclocking. All three of these boards have their own unique biases. I will give the edge to the ASUS model, however, I do believe it's absolutely feature packed. And if it's one thing when it comes to extreme overclocking, a lot of people use ASUS motherboards. Every time I go to an overclocking competition, it's just laid out with crosshair boards. So I guess that does speak uh, lengths to the BIOS features that ASUS implement. Uh, though for standard air and water overclocking, you've again got more than enough in these three boards. If I had to critique Gigabyte, I'd like to see them implement all the features you need for overclocking in one different tab. It's one thing that ASUS and ASRock do quite well. There's also the ability to control fan speeds and of course update your BIOS on the ASRock from the internet within. The ASUS for some reason does it automatically. If you've got an internet connection plugged in, it'll just start updating your BIOS. And so all three of these boards have dual BIOS implemented. Gigabyte has a switch for it, so you can change the BIOS if you wish to manually, or you can change it to have dual BIOS supported from the get-go. Moving through the inputs and outputs on the motherboard themselves, they all have addressable three pin RGB headers as well as four pin RGB headers if you wish to use those. They've all got three 16X slots and two one speed slots if you need PCIe connectivity. There's also 3.1 USB 3 outputs on all three of these boards as well of course USB 3 out. Now onto the most important part of a motherboard, ladies and gentlemen, and that is RGB. If you don't have RGB on your motherboard, well, unfortunately, I don't even know if you could overclock or not. The all jokes aside, uh, all three of these boards have addressable RGB. You can control that within the BIOS or Windows itself via all three of their apps. Uh, however, I will give the edge to the Gaming 7. I just think this thing looks gorgeous. I love the way they've implemented the RGB from the board itself around the PCIe slots and also the RAM DIMM slots themselves. But speaking of the RAM DIMM slots, I did forget to mention that they've all got two phases dedicated to RAM overclocking, and I didn't find a difference between overclocking on all three boards. I also did test the 2700 out uh, as opposed to the non-X because I will have a video of that upcoming later and they all scored 4.2 gigahertz absolutely fine. Uh, so that was good to see. There was no real difference between these three motherboards when it came to max overclocking. So now here we are at conclusion time and a big question I get asked all the time with motherboard comparisons is which one of these three boards would I buy personally? And that all depends of course on the price. They all actually have different prices and different features that differentiate them. So let's start off with the ASUS Crosshair Formula 7 first. This is $299 US dollars. In Australia, $469 dollars. So I would like to see that Australian price, at least to PPP terms, come down a little bit. Uh, but what you get for this money is of course the ducks nuts of motherboards. It's got everything that I could want from a motherboard. Of course, you've got that dual NVMe. You've got a very solid VRM design a BIOS that's absolutely gorgeous. And one thing that I didn't talk about before was the ASUS grid option that's enabled in the BIOS. And if you've got this enabled, as soon as you install Windows, it'll pop up and say, hey, do you wanna get the latest drivers installed? So it's very handy and it's a great innovation. It's things like this that I notice and they are going in the right direction. In terms of overclockability, onboard audio, everything, this thing is a complete package and it's got the addressable RGB too. I couldn't ask for more from a motherboard. Phenomenal job, Azus. So now we're moving on to the Gaming 7 Wi-Fi, and this is coming in a lot cheaper than the Crosshair. 
So it's coming at 237 bucks. And in my opinion, it offers the best aesthetic out of all three designs. Of course, you do get those orange accents. They may not be for everyone, uh, but that comes with the orange LED lighting out of the box. And as I said before, I think it looks absolutely gorgeous. Heatsink design, I think it's a step in the right direction. Even though some people think it's going a step backwards, uh, I would rather the uh, cost of aesthetics for the increase in performance, if that makes any sense. And in this time around, I think the aesthetic actually looks gorgeous on this board anyway. Of course, VRM design, phenomenal. BIOS could use a little bit of tweaking. Onboard audio is really good, but keep in mind, I did come into a little bit of a problem where I had to use the front audio out if I was a headphone user or speakers that needed amp from the motherboard themselves. So do keep that in mind. Though in terms of everything else, it's only got a Gen 3 X4. It's only got one of those on the NVMe. So even though it says rateable, the bottom slot is Gen 2. So other than that, absolutely phenomenal board. This one is definitely hitting hard for the price. And now the last solution on the table here is the ASRock Taichi Ultimate. This comes in at 299 US dollars. In Australia, there's actually no pricing at the moment, but this is a solution that you get if you need onboard 10 gigabits per second NIC solution. Though as I said in the dedicated review, which I'll put a link up here, if you do need 10 gigabits per second NIC solution, then I sort of suggest grabbing uh, one of those dedicated PCIe add-in cards and then porting that over from build to build. I believe this would be a lot more efficient because there is the Tai Chi regular version, which comes in $70 cheaper and it has pretty much the same feature set. And in Australia, it's 339 Australian dollars. You do get two extra USB ports on the Tai Chi regular too. Of course, big thing about this motherboard, 12 plus four phase power design. It's huge, it's a monster. It's really good. The BIOS feature set's really good. Onboard audio is phenomenal. Uh, however, it doesn't have an IO shield like the other two automatically implemented from the get-go. It's something that I do like personally, and I'd like to see ASRock follow the trend of these other two here and follow that and implement it into their own motherboards. Anyway, when it all comes down to it, all three of these boards are absolutely phenomenal. Of course, they are expensive. That's one thing to keep in mind. They do include the Store MI license technology too, but they all are going a step in the right direction in my opinion. I could see myself using any of these boards in my main rig. I'd have absolutely no qualms with any three of them. Of course, you're probably wondering where's the MSI board? Uh, MSI, I mean, if you know, pick up, pick up the phone send me some text back. I don't know what's going on there, but yeah, I'd love to have their motherboard on the bench here to do a four-way comparison for you guys. But as it stands, can recommend all three of these options in terms of the feature set. Just watch the whole review and see which one best fits your needs as that at the end of the day is what it's about, which one is best for you. Hope you enjoyed today's review. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button. If you have any questions or comments about any three of these boards, be sure to drop a comment in the comment section below. I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye. Thing about a motherboard, and that is RGB. If you don't have RGB, well, I don't even know if you can overclock because the gigabyte, this is where. Uh, but what we're seeing with the. Fuck, where was I at? Um, however, there was really crow. Really crow. IR33, yeah. Okay. Is it? As it only has seven.